Um, we hadn't decided who would speak first, so I think Len, perhaps. Why, thank you. I would d defer at this moment as we. Well, first of all, thank you all for having us. And okay. it's always a pleasure to be with Thelma, who I think is one of the most interesting, creative, and daring museum directors. And since Anna brought up the subject of leadership and what does it take to stay current, uh, it's something that we've thought a lot about together. Uh, we were often on committees and um, boards that uh, endeavor to provide some kind of frame for uh, how American museums uh, deal with the myriad issues that are out there. But let me, let me begin by just saying, Thelma, you've been in leadership programs. Uh, what do you see as sort of the critical issue for you at, at, at the Studio Museum in terms of your very personal direction uh, to your staff? I, you're right, I have been in leadership programs, particularly here at the Aspen Institute, where I'm proud to be a Henry Crown Fellow. And through that process and many others, I guess I would say I consistently am striving always to define purpose for the institution, for my team, for the community we're in, and very specifically for our mission, right? So trying to uphold the standards of our founding, the aspirations, the dreams of the people who founded the museum in 1968, but also to continue to make that relevant um, for what we are and what we can be today. You know, it's interesting, we're, we're a slightly older institution, actually even had a little role in the founding of the Studio Museum, mm -hmm. so we're closing in on 90 years in an institution that in 1929 believed that it was a contemporary institution, that it was, it was all about the present. Mm -hmm. And of course, with close to a century of history, the present means something very different. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one of the biggest struggles we have as an institution is how do you retain the founding impetus to be an, a place of experimentation. Our founding director called us a laboratory in which the public was invited to participate and honor a history that has been carefully honed uh, and for which a lot of people have bought in. And I think this becomes a huge issue for any museum that deals with modern or contemporary art, which is where do you position yourself institutionally and intellectually along mm -hmm. a spectrum from you know, the leading edge to, let's say, something far more traditional. And there's always going to be a tug of war there. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the challenges we have as directors is to cajole, convince, uh, and find a space mm -hmm. in which a brilliant staff can take the risks that ultimately uh, define an institution. And I, and I think that's one of the hardest things to do because there's only so much change any institution can tolerate before it devolves into something like chaos. Mm -hmm. So how, how much change is too much? Well, I think you only know when you've crossed that line uh, <laughs> retrospectively. Uh, and you know, I have a lot of scars on my back to demonstrate uh, how often we've crossed the line. But it's a very complicated thing. I mean, often, at least in our case, some of the most ardent agents of change are actually our trustees. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the more careful players are curators. And it's not because they're uninterested, but because they feel an enormous responsibility to their predecessors uh, and to wanting to get it right. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we've, and I never wanted to bifurcate the contemporary from the modern, mm -hmm. which would be a solution. Mm -hmm. You have one group of people who are doing crazy things over here, and you have another group of people who are dealing with a past and a history that's mm -hmm. more definable. Because it always struck me that there was a creative tension between those two poles. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's about oscillation. You're mm -hmm. bouncing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, trying to do so in a way that avoids it ever rupturing into a into a real crisis where fault lines are defined and people harden their positions. Mm -hmm. And I think, at least from my perspective, one of the challenges I have and some of the people on the senior staff have is nudging people, mm -hmm. cajoling people, but never pushing past the point of discomfort. So there's some space, yeah. some metaphoric space mm -hmm. that's really productive mm -hmm. uh, where there's a degree of discomfort. And then I think there's another space where it's utterly destructive. Mm -hmm. 
Did you always know this? You've been director almost 20 years. And is this something that you have come to understand after 20 years of being director of the Museum of Modern Art? Or was it always some intuitive knowledge about how institutional transformation should come about? Oh, no. I, I, <laughs> what is it? You learn from your mistakes. If you make enough mistakes, you ought to learn a lot. So mm -hmm. I've made plenty of mistakes. No, I, it, I was lucky when I came to the museum, I, uh, at the encouragement of my wife, had lunch with Philippe de Montebello, who you know, by then had 20 years plus at the Met and mm -hmm. was then and continues to be a bit of a legend, and said, so like, how did you pull all of this off? And he had a, he had a number of ideas that I've tried to adhere to, one of which was never fight battles you don't have to win. Mm -hmm. So there's an awful lot that you can let go in order to save your energy and your credibility for the things you really care about. Mm -hmm. You learn, and I certainly uh, took a long time to learn this, that Sometimes 90% is good enough. Uh, for people who are perfectionists, that's sometimes very hard to come to grips with. And that you have to trust your staff and you have to trust the art. And I, it's been a tough, it's tough sometimes to get all of those mm -hmm. aspects right. But I, I have this very simple theory of leadership, uh, which I wonder if it's true in your case. Although I don't think it's true in your case because you're so remarkable. My, my theory is, when you become a director, you have 100 jelly beans in your jar. Mm -hmm. And if you do nothing, there's a burn rate of jelly beans. Uh, so you can't just do nothing. You have to act. But every time you spend a jelly bean, it's irreplaceable. You cannot do something that's so clever a year later that you can replenish your stock. So you have to figure out, in a way, a strategy of burn rate. Right. Uh, and I wonder if you feel the same way, because you've done such an incredible job, Thelma. So, so the truth of this is there are two things here. One, you, when you became director, you went and had lunch with Philippe. And when I became director, I went and had lunch with Glenn. So <laughs> that, OK. Two, Glenn did not, I, the first time I heard him tell this jelly bean thing was about six months ago. And I realized that not only have I spent all my jelly beans, I'm now borrowing jelly beans from all over the world. I owe, every, I owe everyone jelly beans everywhere. And I'm sure I will never be able to pay them all back. No, you know what, here's, here's what I think. Um, I you know, feel super privileged to be working at an institution that's 45 years old but still really new. You know, we were created out of wishes and dreams, literally, um, with an incredible amount of um, artistic innovation at the heart but also political passion. And what that does and has done is it means that many times it means standing out on faith, right? That, that everything necessary to continue growing this institution in this place will happen. So I think what I have come now that I know that I only have a certain number of jelly beans and I've spent them um, already, is thinking about how in an institutional structure, um, one that is still forming, how we begin to create the sort of stability Right? that imagines a future. So, you know, we're looking at our 50th anniversary, and it's an incredible moment um, in this country because there are a lot of 50th anniversaries. That's why I'm excited today to hear John Lewis, those of us who had the opportunity to go to the March on Washington celebrations, and just to sit in the history of this, you know, the part of the last century into this one. And the Studio Museum um, was a part of that. And so I think that in many ways it is about this, for me, thinking about the past, but also thinking about creating a new present for us. And in that, that's where perhaps I am probably always um, acting completely in the moment of what can happen and what can be done next. That being said, I also um, you know, come to this as a curator and still very much think about what I am doing from the place of art and artists. And that, in many ways, has created just a different set of priorities and contexts to think about what it means to be the director, the director of the studio museum, but a museum director in general. And I think often, you know, we're often positioned in this way that our institutions are so different. You know, Glenn and I had the opportunity to speak together about a year ago, and the um, invitation that was created had our pictures next to each other. It looked like a prize fight poster, right? It was Glenn and I uh, next to each other. And, you know, I remember what was important about that is that we tried very hard to sort of think outside of what the obvious differences 
right? In, yeah. in how we might work might be, and look at where the places of similarity, right? As we try both in many different ways um, to think and rethink again um, the institutions that we both um, now have the responsibility to steward. So one of the things you're doing that uh, is really bold and daring, mm -hmm. uh, and in an institution like mine, somewhat easier to do, is embarking on an incredibly ambitious capital campaign mm -hmm. and an incredibly ambitious building program, mm -hmm. which uh, is essentially unprecedented. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, you know, how did you get to that point? Mm -hmm. what, what are the big issues that you're thinking about? And what are the aspirations mm -hmm. for this when it's completed? Yeah. Well, it's that, you know, we've been in Harlem on 125th Street um, for our whole life. The museum began on Fifth Avenue and moved around the corner um, about 10 years later. Um, we own our building, which is an amazing thing in real estate terms in Harlem. And so our ability now to consolidate and really uh, do what has been important for the institution all along, which is to steward our building, importantly, but also to create spaces that really respond to the nature of our neighborhood. And so we've been very lucky in New York with our Department of Cultural Affairs to have the opportunity to think and rethink how the space can respond more to our program, our collection, our mission, but also to the neighborhood. And a lot of it is responsive to what is the just dynamism of what's happening in Harlem. Super important part um, of our city. Um, in terms of just you know raising money, we are 50 years old, going to be 50 years old. And so the opportunity there is to look at creating a financial infrastructure for an institution that was founded, again, um, with very little resources, but an incredible amount of ambition, and to really make good on the promise of our founders. And so what we hope for after that is another 50 years in our neighborhood, in Harlem, um, but in a Harlem that's changing and in an institution that's changing, and really with um, all of, again, our founding mission's promise, but with new priorities. One of the important things, you know, in sort of thinking about um, our future is, is really been thinking about the issue of program. Right? Because as an institution, you know, we were founded to really address the exclusion of black artists in the museum world. Right? It was a very political ideal. It, had, it was uh, undergirded by important art history that really said that there were artists, African-American artists, artists of African descent, whose contributions had not been adequately acknowledged. And the museum's life began as one to write that history. Rewrite the history, to rewrite the canon, to really engage in some you know, radical rethinking of how we can understand these contributions. And as the museum has had a role in transforming right, the art world as it understands artists of African descent, we are constantly in a state of thinking about what that means, right? what it means to be a specific institution, a culturally specific institution. I sort of feel the place we're at now in this century in the world is that we're all culturally specific in some way, right? That sort of idea of difference that so defined the politics of the way my institution was founded really can apply to all institutions when we think of the global art world that we're living in. You know, it's interesting. The, I think the impact that the Studio Museum has had is utterly remarkable for, if you, you think about the scale of it mm -hmm. uh, and the way in which its programs and the artists it's championed have radiated out. And I think we're, we've certainly been an enormous beneficiary and have learned a great deal from you and your staff and many of the artists uh, that you have so eloquently uh, talked about. And I do think that there is a huge role in our uh, culture, civilization, for advocacy, mm -hmm. right? Because at the end of the day, we can't be all things to all people, mm -hmm. no matter how much that's a noble idea. Mm -hmm. So having advocates ensures that a plethora of positions mm -hmm. are always going to be present and uh, available. But I, I also think it becomes complicated in a place like New York, where there are so many different mm -hmm. opportunities. Navigating what the right balance is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly something we're always thinking about. We serve a local audience, I mean a really local audience, and we serve a global audience, mm -hmm. and they don't have similar interests mm -hmm. sometimes. And I think part of trying to position an institution is to figure out where you're aiming at, right? right? To kind mm -hmm. of imagine who your audience is, who your primary audience is, and how you're going to engage that audience. And I, I wonder, do, does the studio, has the notion of audience for, for you changed over the years? 
Um, yes, um, the audience of notion, the notion of audience has changed um, simply, again, because our community has changed so much. So to talk about Harlem right now is to talk about a community that is transforming, that it's gentrifying, yes, that's what everyone speaks about, but it's also becoming much more multicultural. It is thinking about itself in very global ways. It's a community with a very big African immigrant community, and there are so many ways in which the neighborhood is different than it was when we were founded in 68 or in 48 or when my father was born in the neighborhood in 1926. Literally, it's like to several different generations of community. So we do think about that. But in terms of the experience of the institution, you know, one of the things that was most interesting to me sort of inheriting this position was that for many small institutions, right, your goal is always a kind of legitimacy, right? So you try and create an institutional experience that will allow your audience, your donors, your visitors to see you, right, in this sort of light maybe much greater than really exists. And, you know, it can go down to very big things and very small things, but one of the things that was interesting to me was our um, recorded message when you called sounded really corporate you know, and just really generic in a way that I just couldn't imagine anyone calling it from Mars would imagine that they had just reached the Studio Museum in Harlem. Like it felt like somehow or another it just needed to shift. And in really deciding to think about um, that we want to be speaking to lots of different audiences, but to create an experience of a museum that speaks of not just place, but culture very specifically, became um, interesting and a project that remains for me and my team ongoing um, as we develop what, what we do. You talked about the um, voice message, uh, and that made me think, how, how deep into the details of the museum do you get? Are you, okay. are you right there touching everything? I am, but that's because, you know, I run an institution with, you know, a staff of 40 um, and, you know, a budget, you know, a, a budget smaller than the Museum of Modern Art. And, <laughs> and so, Be you know, grateful. Yeah, so <laughs> imagine that I am in the details. Now, I say this because I laugh because often I will say something to Glenn, like minutia, like I'll say, I went on Saturday and the straws in the cafe were blue. And he'll say something like, yeah, now we're having different color straws every day. And I think, how do you know this? How are you able to have that? I mean, I know what color the straws are at the Studio Museum because I probably went and bought them, right? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> They're laughing. Really. But it's true. <laughs> really. So I, I know what color they are. But, you know, the fact is, so how deep in the details am I? Well, um, very, but very in a way that it is just a question of, you know, being able to achieve what we hope to achieve at the institution and having that happen as a team that we're all very in the details in that way. I mean, so, you know, I, I don't live as close to my museum as you live to yours, um, but, you know, snow removal, you know, is a big deal, right? We had a, you know, winter, I mean, we're in Aspen, so I guess you all know everything about snow removal, but in New York, you know, this requires a little bit of maneuvering and, um, you know, my proximity to the institution, you know, means that, you know, in many ways that, you know, my sense of what I'm involved in, what I'm not, and when, what, what would be an appropriate role and what wouldn't be, changes because it really starts at what are our goals, right? And our goals are to be open to our audience, right, on a day that might be a snow day for schools in New York City, to be fully open in a way that people in the neighborhood can come. So that means snow removal, right, is a high priority for that moment. That being said, one of my great commitments, because I am someone who was very well trained. I had the opportunity to spend over a decade working at the Whitney with amazing colleagues who taught me well, literally, what I know how to do. My first job was right out of college at the Studio Museum, working for the then director, Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell, who also trained me incredibly well. And so I also believe deeply in the opportunity the museum can provide to train museum professionals. So we're all deeply in it in the way that it allows us all to gain the skills that we potentially and possibly um, need to move the museum forward. Can we talk for a moment about training? Because I think it's one of those subjects you and I have discussed 
on a number of occasions, mm -hmm. and where I think the Studio Museum has been a leader in the field. That mm -hmm. There may be a lot of reasons for it, but mm -hmm. the reality is you've taken that commitment very seriously, mm -hmm. and you have uh, matriculated some of the most talented uh, young men and women working in the museum world today. We're very lucky uh, to have one who's Thomas Lacks, who's just joined us, and who wouldn't be Thomas Lacks without uh, what you've done. But I'm actually really interested in, in a larger question, which mm -hmm. is, how do we encourage uh, African-American men and women to have careers in the arts? And, and what role do you see the Studio Museum playing in that? Mm -hmm. is, in, in, is that actually something we should be thinking about? Mm -hmm. um, I think what we should be thinking about in the museum world is having institutions that have staffs and teams that really reflect the breadth and diversity of America. Right? That's what I think. I think that we need to do that because it's what will make our institutions smarter and more, have more depth and be richer and more complex in the ways that the art that all of us show already demands. Like that's the reality, right? right? Um, I think to make this happen, it means that we all have to have a commitment to the nurturing of people in the field, right? And it's not just the training, it is the nurture, it's yeah. both. Right? It is the, the hard skills, but also the deep investment to allow young professionals to see themselves in this field and also to have the support to have a path in it that allows them to do the kind of amazing, important work that we all know they can. Um, I'm committed to that because it's why I am sitting here talking to you right now. Right? It's because I was deeply supported and deeply nurtured. I, um, I believe in it institutionally because it is something that happened for me at the Studio Museum in Harlem specifically. Um, I also believe in it though because I think that it is something in imagining what we all can do right in this field. All of our institutions should be different. There's nothing that makes sense about us all doing the same thing. And this is something that I feel we can do. The Studio Museum can do that. We can do it well. And if it benefits the field, that's for me, then a really fantastic thing that the Studio Museum can be proud of, that can be part of our mission. There are things that we don't do, right? We, we, and we won't do, because as an institution, we have a certain focus and we know what our role can be. But this issue of being able to very specifically kind of target talent, create, nurture, and also advocate very deeply um, for them in the museum world is always going to be um, a real a, a, a mission for me um, and a passion, and in some ways a privilege to be able to do that. Well, you've been incredibly successful at it, and it's something that I think we, we can learn from, and I know that there's always a challenge, at least I see a challenge, with the literally hundreds of interns mm -hmm. that we see a year, many of whom are incredibly able, who ultimately go on to have careers in law or medicine mm -hmm. or become entrepreneurs. And I think one of the things that I, that I try to think about is how do we encourage people mm -hmm. to take the risk to have a career in the arts, mm -hmm. where they're not going to have the financial rewards, right but they're gonna have intellectual and social rewards that are just very different. And, mm -hmm. it, and I do think it's a very difficult thing to do. Yeah, I think it requires um, really being able for them to, for, for young people to understand that passion. I think for those of us who work with artists, we sort of understand that right in the extreme. You and I have the privilege of, you know, Anna Devere Smith is on your board. She, you know, sort of exists as everything for me in many ways. You know, and I think something that I have learned from her, of course, is that that idea of making that choice really comes from understanding how one can have an impact in the world and how one can have an impact in a very specific way. And I think careers in the arts allow for that. Um, now going to Anna certainly had some questions for us and I know for her the issue of collections is really important. And I know it's something that you have thought about and even positioned very provocatively mm -hmm. um, that perhaps in museums it's a place that we need to think about differently, the whole role of collecting. Well, I mean, that? I think the great burden, challenge, and opportunity for American museums is how to thoughtfully grow collections at a time when you can't collect the way you might have uh, 25 years ago, by which I mean 25 years ago you could imagine 
if you're a place like the Museum of Modern Art, that all you needed to do was know what was happening in New York and a few other places, and that was sufficient. Uh, that was a myth and a fiction then. Mm -hmm. It was not right. But you could believe that. Today, that's simply impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first issue is to recognize there's no way any one institution can cover the breadth of what's going on. And that means looking, I think, at how to develop partnerships, associations, relationships, networks, both to, to figure out what is important, but also to reimagine how a collection is developed. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a partner in the New Art Trust with uh, Tate Modern and SF MoMA, which is a, a, an idea created by Pam and Dick Kramlick to essentially share their collection because mm -hmm. they felt no one institution mm -hmm. could ever use that collection mm -hmm. uh, in and of itself, but maybe three institutions mm -hmm. could do something more creative with it. Uh, it's complicated. It seems very easy on the yeah. surface to share collections, but actually um, most of us aren't really good in the sandbox when, when we have to share toys. Uh, so what's hardest about it? Is, it? is it simply this issue of ownership, meaning who has it, or is it really about how, it, how the artwork gets used? I think it's a combination of ownership and possession. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're all control freaks, or at mm -hmm. least most of us are. Uh, it's about learning how to work with other institutions who work differently and respecting that they will arrive at decisions differently. Mm -hmm. uh, it's recognizing that in this case, when you have a body of work that none of us own, mm -hmm. but all of us have access to, what does it mean about acquiring related works, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, that are not gonna be part of the New Art Trust, that mm -hmm. might be part of the Tate or the SF MoMA or, or MoMA. Do we think about this body that's in the middle mm -hmm. and what it means, or do we act utterly independently of each other? And, and there, it's really difficult to work it out, not to create situations where we are essentially uh, only buying certain things because we're anticipating somebody else right. buying something else. Uh, and collecting is one of those aspects of what we do that fuels the passions of our trustees and many members. So we want to collect, mm -hmm. but how much do we have to collect? And there's a paradox, I think, in the American museum world. And it's amplified here rather than in Europe because most of our institutions are largely, if not entirely, privately funded. And the paradox is that over the course of the 20th century, the United States had the wealth, the ambition, and the opportunity to build extraordinary collections, and that's what we did. Uh, we actually now have far more art in our museums mm -hmm. than we probably need to. Uh, and the cost of that is enormous. Mm -hmm. Buildings that require tens of millions of dollars a year to maintain, storage centers that are sometimes bigger than the museums themselves mm -hmm. to store all of this art, and somehow, we have to rationalize and understand how to use that. And I, I really believe that we have evolved from a collecting country to now a programming country. And what we need to do is think not only about our collections, but what do we do with them. It's not good enough simply to own them. We have the challenge of using them intelligently. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a, that is a very different mindset mm -hmm. to think that your program is at least as important, if not more important, than your collection. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not a transition that, that's going to happen quickly, mm -hmm. uh, if it happens at all. Right. Do you see the potential in the future, for example, of major collection sharing possibilities? Right? I mean, you know, we know some out there in the world, but you know, you're speaking, but for example, would you ever consider a part of the Museum of Modern Art collection existing somewhere else in another museum structure? It's not even a question of whether I think that's a good idea or not, or whether I could mm -hmm. imagine it or not. I think it's just going to happen. Right. I, I don't see, uh, mm -hmm. unless there's something even more radical mm -hmm. that happens, I don't see how we collectively mm -hmm. avoid that. First of all, it's smart. Right. Uh, secondly, it makes no sense at all from a utilitarian perspective to have vast resources that are inaccessible, except perhaps digitally online, mm -hmm. uh, to the public when there are other institutions for whom those resources would be cherished mm -hmm. uh, objects. So I think we have to really begin to think imaginatively, both 
within the United States and abroad. But my experience with this, and, and here I'm not speaking simply my experience at the Museum of mm -hmm. Modern Art, my experience seeing colleagues mm -hmm. elsewhere grapple mm -hmm. with this, is right now that's very hard to do. Mm -hmm. uh, just buying a work of art with a colleague right. becomes incredibly difficult. We've done it a number of times, but it's, it's not as straightforward as it seems when you're dealing with the implied perpetuity mm -hmm. of what our institutions uh, stand for. We've looked at sharing collections through programs on short-term basis, but I actually think it's going to be even more interesting to think about sharing whole bodies of material mm -hmm. on long-term basis. Right. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. Anna asked the question of us, what keeps us up at night? You want me to go first? No, uh, certainly. I'll, Everything. Oh. <laughs> I, am the okay, most, the I am the most neurotic person you will ever meet. Uh, uh, there isn't a problem that I didn't think was catastrophic. Uh, and so I, I, and I really mean that. I don't sleep very well and I don't sleep a lot because uh, I live and breathe the museum that I'm privileged to work at. And I live and breathe actually the larger issues that Thelma and I and others share. But I, I do, you know, if I, if I had to reduce it to one thing, I think I worry that at the end of the day, the financial resources that are so essential to enabling our institutions are finite and that we collectively as a, as a group are so wildly under, uh, undercapitalized mm -hmm. that there is a looming dark cloud out there, and we keep kicking the ball down the street because of private philanthropy, all of you and many others. Mm -hmm. but, but I don't know for how long that can continue, and I worry that you know, we could be, <coughs> one shift in the economy could mm -hmm. send a major ripple through what we do. So that, that's the biggest thing that keeps me up at night because I know we have an incredibly talented staff. Mm -hmm. We have loyal and dedicated friends and uh, trustees. We have an incredible audience. All those things are true and constant. Mm -hmm. We have artists who believe in what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's the resources mm -hmm. that, that, it, that we consume right. uh, that worry me. Mm -hmm. uh, what about you? Um, I think what keeps me up most is continually wanting to be sure that we are having an impact, that we are really doing something important, that we're doing something significant, um, that what we are doing has meaning for more people than just a few, and making sure that I'm always aware of what that might mean. So how do you know if you've had impact? What are, what are the ways in which you think about uh, that? Well, um, I think about it, um, I think about understanding impact in you know, a couple different ways. The most important for me is to sort of look again at our mission and to think about this mission to present, preserve, and collect and interpret the work of artists of African descent and how we are able to make manifest that mission every day. Um, I look for impact in the way in which our particular message then resonates right, in a larger art and culture world. I look for impact in the way in which the institution right, sits within the sphere of community, most broadly defined. Um, and I look for it both in the hard facts and the anecdotal, literally. Like it, it, you know, it's the combination of the two on a daily, sometimes hourly basis that allow me to sort of understand or understand what perhaps needs to be rethought. But it is, you know, it's something that I know that I might not be able to fully judge, right, in my time, but to work towards that means that the goals that the institution can and, and does have can be significant and really use our resources well to make good work happen. No, it's, that's the hardest, I, I think impact is the hardest thing to gauge, because we right. all want it, we all mm -hmm. believe in it, we all mm -hmm. feel that actually we need that mirror. We need right. to know yeah. that what we're doing is being received, thought about, debated, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's very hard sometimes to know whether you've really managed to get across a set of issues in a way that has provoked a conversation that's mm -hmm. meaningful to your mm -hmm. public. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea of an, a museum being part of a conversation, right? An art conversation, obviously, um, but a cultural conversation more generally, a civic conversation, 
also, perhaps. And, you know, really when I think about, you know, literally physically the museum in those different spheres, that's another way also to think about how impact might play out, right? That it can have different lives for the institution at different moments. But I also, you know, in terms of what keeps me awake or why, you know, why I might stay awake, it also is just, you know, the idea that, you know, sometimes I feel there's so much work to be done. So many artists to, to look at, to show, so many works to acquire, right? The finite resources, but so many opportunities, right, that our institutions have. And I feel lucky, right, the ones that we are able to make happen, but often sort of think about all of the things that perhaps because of sort of limitations of just time and space that um, cannot happen. Right? So it's really the shows that get away, keep me up. Yes, and every once in a while you see them somewhere else and you say, how did we let that get away? That's right. Exactly, exactly. But, but again, the challenge is you know, staying you know, present in the work mm -hmm. and also in trying to define very significantly you know, what um, a, a mission can be as it is being written in real time. Right? So I mean, I, I think as I say, you know, the dynamism of you know, being an institution that's not so old is that there are still things that need to be formed and the opportunity there to have the voices of artists, to have the voices of the community, to have the voices of colleagues, all in this rich conversation, which can then lead to what to me is just great institution building is incredible and really exciting. So if we shift from impact for a moment, mm -hmm. which is about institutional mm -hmm. uh, presence to something more personal, how do you know when you've been successful? What are, mm -hmm. what are your own measures of success? You know, I don't know. I don't know that, uh, you know, I've ever taken a breath long enough to um, consider that. You know, for my 35th birthday, um, not so long ago, no, no, well, uh, Glenn last Ligon, week, last week. Uh, Glenn Ligon, the artist Glenn Ligon made me um, an artwork, which was the uh, cover of, in his mind, my autobiography. And the title was, I'm curating as fast as I can. <laughs> and. That is how it feels, right? My, my sense of both passion and purpose create a certain way in which that I'm not quite sure um, I am willing to stop to judge success necessarily um, in this moment because I am working towards still many more goals uh, to achieve. You know, this year is a funny one because um, I made a show at the Whitney in 1994 called Blackmail, which will be 20 years old this wow. November. And I have been um, emboldened by many to kind of engage in what will happen this November around, you know, marking that moment. Many of the artists in the exhibition, you know, others, that just to really think about that. And, you know, that's been interesting because it really has made me sort of look back um, and remember that moment, remember that exhibition specifically, but who I was as a curator, what I hoped for, right, to do in this art world, and be able to see some of that, obviously, 20 years later, has been kind of amazing, and will continue to be as I live through these next few months of retrospectively thinking about that moment. Well, that was a brilliant exhibition. I mean, I, that happened just about the same moment I came to New York, exactly. and remember thinking, this is the kind of place you want to be, where exhibitions like that can take place and where the debate can actually mm -hmm. surface. Uh, exactly. It was, you know, if every exhibition had that kind of impact, you mm -hmm. wouldn't have to measure impact. Right. Uh, well, thank you. Should we take questions sure. from this audience? Yes. I think we're supposed to, there's a microphone which they'd like you to use, um, and they're coming down the aisles. So there's a question, yeah. Great. And there's a question over here to the, right in the front as well. Glenn, um, I'm Robert Lehrman, as you know. I've worked in the arts in Washington in my capacity as a trustee at the Hirshhorn. Um, we stand in awe, at least I in Washington, at what MoMA's capacity and what you have helped them to achieve. Thelma mentioned that, you know, she, she is interested in provoking a conversation, both artistic and civic, with impact and meaning and creating outreach about the role of African Americans in contemporary art. You mentioned that you're mostly interested in advocacy and in doing it through programming that you think reflects what the mission of the museum is. Could you tell us what you're advocating for in your programming and what vision you're now trying to make relevant through the museum? 
Well, I would share with Thelma the notion that our single greatest um, issue is today is to ensure that we as an institution are enabling a range of conversations to take place about modern and contemporary art. That we are a convener, if you wish, of those conversations and a stimulator and a catalyzer of those conversations, mm -hmm. both on site, physically, with those who visit us, and digitally with those who connect with us around the world. And this notion of the museum as the convener of a conversation is a fundamentally, radically different notion of the museum that existed 50 and 100 years ago, which saw itself uh, as an instrument of enlightenment, a, a cataloger and classifier of information to be received by a learning public. Uh, and this transformation, which has been going on, not at the Museum of Modern Art or even the Studio Museum, across many other museums, is to recognize that the museum has evolved into a social space, mm. to use the current uh, language. Mm. Uh, a social space about art, for sure, but a place in which it, people are connecting with other people in a uh, conversation about art. So for us, clearly our mission mm is focused on ensuring that the artists, uh, both past and present, that we believe in, have the ability for their work to be seen, understood, and engaged with uh, by the largest possible public we can develop. Uh, and that if we do that well, it will ensure that artists now well familiar and artists not yet heard of will have a place together mm -hmm in some kind of larger discussion about the issues within the art world that are most central and pertinent to the moment. Now those issues often go way beyond the problems of the art world. They engage, of course, history and culture at large. But I think where we have evolved gradually over the last 25 or 30 years is to recognize that the stimulating and catalyzing of these conversations is at the center of what we do, not something that's peripheral. Uh, and that it changes the way you approach education. It changes the way you mm -hmm. approach a curatorial practice. Mm -hmm. It changes the way you think about the space of the gallery. Uh, and that has not come without some controversy uh, in terms of uh, people who want and hold, want to hold on to a very different kind of experience that isn't about the social. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, my name is Bob Cardman. I'm from Boston. <clears throat> the, uh, my question is picking up on words that you have used, uh, uh, collections, programs, impact, uh, networking, and related to uh, themes that we have been involved in at, at the Ideas Festival. Uh, one of the big themes that has come through uh, during our session is that we move from sort of an industrial order to a, a networked order, from mm -hmm. a top-down order mm -hmm. to a bottom-up order. Mm -hmm. uh, just the, the nature of companies and institutions, political, et cetera. So I hope my question is not a challenge, but mm -hmm. let me ask the question and you'll tell me if it is a challenge. And that is that if you use a paradigm of say Wikipedia mm -hmm. or Uber or Airbnb or all of these, these are all highly democratic mm -hmm. uh, bottoms up institutions. It's not from the directors, mm -hmm. it's not from the CEO, mm -hmm. it's not from the curators. So relevance, if you want it to come from the bottom in the Wikipedia model mm -hmm. is to say uh, we have this fabulous building, these mm -hmm. fabulous things in this building, and why don't we make available our audio video guides mm -hmm. to our audience and say, come on in, you make our tours, mm -hmm. and we'll even give you prizes based upon, uh, or, or we'll have audience participation, and therefore, it's a bottom-up experience of the institution where you can capture the best of the thinking of those people who find you vital by your making available to them the best of your equipment. 
Um, I think this is something clearly that in the museum field we have talked about, right? Because really what you're talking about when you use the example of, say, you know, Wikipedia or just crowdsourcing generally is this idea of expertise, right? That, that our model is sort of based on the idea of the director, the curator, with their expertise, creating and defining the space for the art and not our audience. I think the way in which, and I you know, will say, we have not necessarily at least gotten to the tip of the iceberg, right, of figuring out how fully to engage in that way in museums. What I will say is that for many of us, at least at the Studio Museum, it's provided an important point of contact to say that we can have both things happening at the same time, right? That we can have an exhibition curated by a curator, but that we also have many different spaces, mostly through social media, where the idea of the audience voice or the tour that's created through someone else's voice and vision can also be shared widely. I do think, though, there's still much more that we need to do in museums to fully engage with this, to fully find a way to, on the one hand, satisfy what I think many of us know, that our audiences do come and want some expertise. They want the experience that comes from that, but also want to engage with it as well. So that th this is a place of deep work, um, deep, interesting work. And I think many of us are committed to really existing and, and with our colleagues in other worlds, right, where this has become so much more um, the norm than, say, in the museum world, to figure out ways in which that we can and really allow audiences that level of engagement with our collections, with the works of art, and with us very directly as a conversation. I think it's incredibly exciting. I, I think it's actually, the, the, underneath the question is, I think, uh, um, a larger uh, challenge, which is how do all of us, especially mm -hmm. those of us who work in physical spaces, yeah move from being analog thinkers mm -hmm. to digital thinkers. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean digital in the sense of, mm -hmm. you know, technology and electronics. Mm -hmm. I mean digital in terms of a completely networked, um, almost hierarchical free environment. Mm -hmm. How do we learn yeah. to think that way in order to enable a whole range of new ideas, processes, relationships to emerge? Mm -hmm. Clearly my generation is not going to succeed completely. We'll adapt, we'll change, but it'll be one or two more generations before you have people who never actually thought in an analog way to begin with. Uh, and that will produce a very different uh, context. Already I see that just in the different difference between curators who are in their late 40s and curators who are in their late 20s and early 30s. You don't think of that as much of a gap, but it's a huge gap in terms of how they were taught uh, mm -hmm. at school and at graduate school. So I think we're in the midst of a really interesting mm -hmm. change. Uh, but I'd just add underneath that, for all of the value of crowdsourcing and audience participation, you have to remember as well that expertise, knowledge, is a, is a really valuable commodity. You wouldn't actually have uh, a doctor operate on an aneurysm that you have based on crowdsourcing. You'd actually hope that that doctor had been well-trained and knew what to do, even if the, there was a, a lot of people who said, don't do it this way. Uh, and there's a lot of knowledge that curators have about the mm -hmm. objects that they work with. And mm -hmm. so it's really trying to strike a balance between sharing that high degree of expertise along with encouraging a broad public uh, engagement with it. Yes. Just a comment as a, a person who yeah. uh, frequents museums, and a person, I, I'm in museums all the time, mm -hmm. and, um, and I think it's interesting to have um, social intercourse about um, people's feelings about um, an exhibition and sharing these experiences. But I, as um, someone who's extremely interested in art, would be very disappointed if I went into a show mm -hmm. and I couldn't do an audio and hear the um, curators who have helped to um, mm -hmm. uh, put this show together and collect all this knowledge and their expertise, I really would be disappointed if that wasn't my experience. Right. So right. 
not to say that what you're saying is wrong, it's just for me as an individual, right. that would be hugely um, disappointing. And I think we see both sides. I'm working um, with one of Glenn's curators now, Leah Dickerman, who's um, doing an exhibition of Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. Right. And she's doing an audio guide with all of her expertise, which is amazing. But at the same time, we are working with her on bringing real voices into this, right? People, African Americans, who actually did the Great Migration and came to New York. Right, no, I know, but, but still, and we are crowdsourcing some of that information to be able to gather those stories. And so I think that it's about having many layers, right? Yeah. Because, yeah. Right, yeah. having many layers, right. I think we have time, one more question. There's one back on the, yeah. Thank you very much, very interesting discussion. You both must see so much art. Mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering if you could just share with us a few artists or people that you think are really oh gosh. interesting. Oh I'm gosh. Sorry, I'm sure you could go on for some time. So yeah. we'll just ask for, a, for each of you to maybe name know. a couple. Super. That's the question sort of next to what is your favorite work in your collection, right? Um, that really can't be answered really well. Um, uh, what I'll say is um, that at the Studio Museum we have a residency program. It's where the studio and our name comes from. And every year, three artists in that program. We're now getting ready for the end of the year of our current three, Bethany uh, Collins, Kevin Beasley, and Abigail DeVille, getting ready for the next group. So I'm you know, deeply sort of invested in that space of emerging artists. But I don't know if I could speak more broadly um, without perhaps saying too many things, but there's lots of art. I'll, I'll say this, lots and lots of art um, right now that is really exciting me. And I'll say in particular, I have for the last, I don't know, year or so, been incredibly, incredibly interested in painting. I'm looking at a lot of painters. You know, you've got, I see out in the audience yeah. a number of incredible collectors. Mm -hmm. I'm staring at Mira and Don Rubel, who, who, who kind of define adventuresomeness. I think the interesting thing that those of us who are lucky enough to spend as much time as Thelma and I have uh, looking at art and talking to artists is there, is so, there are so many highly talented artists out there, few of whom actually ever matriculate into the system and become well-known. But if you have the courage to go out and look uh, and think about what you're seeing and challenge yourself, it's an amazingly rewarding world to be in. And actually, museums are nice jumping off points, but really the action is taking place in studios, uh, often in galleries, uh, in alternative art spaces. Mm -hmm. And I I've trained myself to be an omnivore, to sort of go out and not look at the art that I'm familiar with and know mm -hmm. about, Mm -hmm. but try and find myself engaged with art that I don't know about, that makes me uncomfortable, that, that makes me uncertain. I mean, Kevin Beasley's a perfect example. When I first encountered what he was doing, I thought, come on. Uh, he, he worked with sound, among mm -hmm. other things. Mm -hmm. And the more I listened to him talk and the more I listened to him perform, I started to think, wow, he has tapped into a vein that we need to know about. He's, mm -hmm. he, he's an extraordinary young man in and of himself, mm -hmm. but it's, so just as Thelma's talking about uh, being sort of uh, turned on again by painting, mm -hmm. I found myself being turned on by sound, uh, which mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about uh, in a very long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank, Thank you more. all. Thank you all. Thank you.